Thank you, Jordan, for that introduction. I'd like to transition now into information that is based on the understanding of and influencing factors of pig body weight variation in a population. This project was a funded lit review and ultimately development of information with the, in conjunction with the Cargill and Pravini group. In particular, I'd like to thank Drs. Matt Ritter and Chad Pilcher for all their time and support of this project, as well as our graduate student, Andreas Tolosa, who was the one responsible for the, the digging in to the literature, helping find the information that ultimately led to the development of a curve on, on CV and standard deviation in pig populations, as well as helping to go through the literature and find management and nutrition practices that may influence the CV of a pig population. We all recognize that pig body weight variation is inherent. And if variation is high in early growth, it's most likely to be maintained through the rest of the growth stages of the pig. For lightweight pigs, this means additional days on feed and feed costs in order to achieve a target weight above that of a sort discount that may be implemented by a packer. And this is due to when the packer goes to sell the retail cuts, they may lose cutout value because of that variation or particularly those that are on the small side of trying to sell to the retail market. Thus refining the management practices of modern production systems requires additional work and research that considers pig growth and development over the entire birth to slaughter period. And in fact, if we're gonna influence body, the final weight and the final CV of pigs at, at marketing, most likely this starts back to the maternal side. There's many practices that we'll talk about today that may have in fact potential to help us improve in this area. So in order to understand variation, we, have, we recognize that variation exists in, in all populations. And in pigs, it's important that we recognize that genetic selection is, is important when we have variation so we can select those highest performing animals to be used for the next generation of those selected traits. However, when we look at understanding variation, we need to really look at two concepts. First is the mean and the standard deviation of the pig population live weight. In addition, the coefficient of variation or CV which is the standard deviation is expressed as a percentage of the mean. Thus, these two measurements are interrelated just depending how we would like them expressed for that population. So in this, for the first part of this study that I'd like to visit about is actually development of the relationship between pig body weight from weaning until market on, based on CV or standard deviation. In this, Andreas did a review of the literature to identify all data where starting individual pig weights and ending weights were present, as well as if there was interim weights available. There was 24 studies from thesis chapters or published data sets that were initially identified. And again, data was not included if it was already pre-screened or if pigs were sorted, parts of that population were omitted uh, as part of whatever research that they were trying to accomplish because of that would ultimately bias uh, the initial CV of the starting weights of a population, thus would not be reflective of what we see on an everyday basis in our wean groups. In the end, 16 data sets with 204 body weight data points were included, which is reflective of over 117,000 individually weighed pigs. The sample sizes in these different data sets range from 120 up to 4,100. And I would point out that there is several uh, numerous commercial studies that were involved in this, which I think adds to the robustness of this data set to get to over 117,000 individually weighed pigs that were included. When CV was reported in a data set, standard deviation could be calculated and vice versa. So really what we wanna show first here is the relationship in body weight, uh, of pig body weight in relation to CV or standard deviation. We present them both on this particular slide. Along the horizontal axis is the body weight um, of the pigs reflective in the both from a CV or standard deviation along the, the uh, horizontal axis. On the left is, is, is the data reflective as a CV. And if you remember, CV is, a, is expressed as a percentage. And what you'll find is that there's a higher level of variation early or at weaning compared to that 
as we get closer to market, when we put the pigs on a, uh, when we're on a CD, which is on a percentage. And this has to do with, again, as we have smaller body weights at the beginning at weaning, but as a percentage difference between them can be very high. And in fact, we, what we have is, is approximately a 20% CV early, and it's about reflective about 10 in the later portion or closer to market. And as we look through the data sets and as you'll see other information I'll present briefly here today, you'll often see that early on about 20 and often in late a CV of about on average 10. Now, if we were to put this on a standard deviation, which is actually reflective of pig weight, you'll see it tightens up and these data points are very similar early on, which again is reflective to a, a more uniform body size at that point. And as those pigs grow, and you'll see along this curve as they get to heavier weights, in fact, we have more variation around the mean. But again, that would be expected because it's reflective of actual body weights in that population as we get to uh, a, a heavier body weight. So with each one of these, depending on how you'd like to report uh, body weight on a CV or standard deviation, a, a curve has been developed at a high uh, predictability, we feel. Um, and we think this is reflective of the amount of pigs and the robustness of this particular data set. I want to transition now into looking at strategies that actually we can use to influence body uh, weight CV of these pig populations. There's lots of different data out there and, and want to point out that some of this data sets were not involved in the meta-analysis that we just presented, mainly because we want to get to actually pre-weaning and in the influence that that may have, or even in the post weaning period, uh, different strategies. And we'll get to that in the second stage of this educational piece, looking at strategies and, and showing you some data. So while there's many different areas, uh, we're just gonna highlight some of these. They're all important, but due to time, we're not able to, to talk about every one of these that we felt and wanted to highlight as the main points. And if you have questions afterwards, we can sure follow up on those as well. The first data set I'd like to look at is the CV from birth to market based on litter size. And in this particular case, then this, uh, in these sow groups, the, the sows were divided if they had three to 10 pigs, 11 to 13, or 14 to 19. And what we'll see is at birth, there was a statistical difference based on the litter size number with those that had three to 10 having the highest CV and those with the highest initial um, litter size having the lowest. However, what you'll see at weaning through market, there was no difference in the pig population based on if they were from the smallest litters or the, the highest number of litters, 14 to 19, at the time of market. Thus reflecting there was a difference early, but not necessarily when those pigs started to be marketed. In addition, if we look at parity, in this particular data set, there was Parities were segregated from parity one to parity five, reflected by the different colors. And what we can see is at birth, pigs that were uh, the litters from parity one had the lowest variation, while those from parity five had the highest. And this was linear at birth. This was also linear at day seven of, of during the suckling period. It was linear from the it, at weaning at day 21 but it was no differences found again at the end of the nursery period. Thus, while there was variation early, there was not found at the end of the nursery period. And this can be reflective again, as we look at uh, parity ones in this particular case had the lowest amount of piglets born uh, compared to the higher uh, parities, thus just offering some variation, maybe reflective of, of some of the, the, the size of those litters as well in this particular case. Now, if we look at weaning age's influence on CV, uh, Roger Main and others uh, in 2004 uh, did a couple commercial studies, and we're going to talk about one of those here, looking at the weaning age of 12 to 21. And in this particular case, if we look at weaning, and again, what we want to look here is the blue bars across all four weaning ages, there's a quadratic effect where the highest CV was those that were weaned at only 12 days of age at a 20.4, then there was a decrease at 15 and really maintained that same CV once we got over day 12. If we looked then at the end of nursery reflective on the orange bar, again, there was the high, this was a quadratic effect with the highest level of variation at, uh, 
at the end of nursery for those that were weaned at day 12, and then had a decrease of diminishing returns. It was a quadratic effect, but the lowest numerical was for those oldest weaned pigs at the end of nursery. Now, interesting and really something I want to point out in this particular data set, if we look at market weight CV, there was a statistical linear decrease as weaning age increased up to day 21, uh, and they had a CV of nine compared to that back of the youngest wean at 12.4. Thus, this data set would show uh, a difference in CV based on body based on the weaning age. And even if we get more today's reflective of 18 to 21, still part of that linear curve of a decrease between 18 and 21. From a split suckling management standpoint, uh, we wanted to talk about, and, and there's a particular study by Donovan and others. While there's no statistics reported, because it wasn't necessarily, this was something we, had, we gleaned from the data and they didn't run statistics on, but we felt it was important to point out. I want to just go to this, the graph on the right, which is the amount of pigs greater than nine pounds. In this particular study, they had a control where there was no split suckling completed, or just the, they then they divide the litters up, and part of the litters, just the lightest pigs were allowed to split suckle, where the heaviest pigs were removed um, for, a, for a couple hours. Or in this part, what's called all is reflective of pigs that both the lightest and the heaviest were split suckled uniformly and then put back as a common litter. And what we can see is pigs greater than nine pounds, we actually saw a percentage increase when pigs were not split suckled, approximately a 4% increase in the lightest pigs, as well as then reflective when all the pigs were split suckled. And many producers implement split suckle feeding. And this is what I wanna point out as a way to help bring up those lightest pigs weight uh, that would have a potential impact on the entire litter CV to help producers then down the line as well. I want to transition now to post weaning strategies. And again, there's many different data sets out there. We just want to highlight some of those here in the bolded categories. Again, not that the other ones aren't important, just due to time and we can sure answer questions or visit about them at the end of this or in follow up after swine day uh, session as well. The first one we want to visit about is diet complexity and in its impact on variation in the nursery period. We can see that in this case of Roger Main, again, looked at uh, as part of their weaning age information that they generated, they looked at complexity in the nursery. And in fact, you can see if we look at a less complex versus more complex starter diet program, we were not able to see in this particular case a difference in CV at weaning at the end of nursery or there at market. Well, again, some slight numerical uh, uh, was present um, at the end of nursery. We were not able to carry that through statistically until the market period. Again, a lot of complicating factors may come into this in terms of individual production systems, in terms of age of weaning, health status, different things. But in this particular commercial study, we was not able to find that statistically at, at the time of market. Here's a data study that, that looked at more of, we want to think about precision feeding. And so in this particular group, if we look in the blue at group one, this is light pigs fed to a specific budget, or they were made sure that they received their allotted amount versus in group two, where the pigs were more in a mixed setting where big pigs, as well as the, the half of the light pigs and were, were fed together on a budget but not specific. So the biggest pigs may have consumed more of the budget because they were bigger, heavier, had a higher feed consumption. And what I want to point out here is if we look at the blue bars first on uh, for those light pigs, when they were fed on a more specific program, their CV linear improved from day 83 to day 165, decreasing from approximately 14 to just under 10. Statistically, we had differences uh, in day 146 and 163 between the lightest pigs fed a specific diet or those more in the mix or more traditional way that we feed pigs in that mixed population to a budget where we could reduce. Thus, reinforcing the fact that some of our lightest pigs within a growing population are falling behind because they're or in contributing to more variation because they're simply falling behind, not getting enough budget of the specific diets. In this particular study, I believe there was four different phases fed throughout that period. 
And this is really highlighted here, as I just talked about, looking at those lightest pigs, even though we started approximately at the same weight at day 64. Those pigs, in this case, the, because they're all the lightest ones that we were able to measure, those fed by a specific budget, or those fed the standard budget that were mixed in that uh, with the other population, those uh, small pigs that received their budget specifically had a statistically higher ending body weight at day 163, thus reinforcing not only did we drive down CV, we also, that was a function of improved body weight when those smallest pigs were fed to their specific amount rather than being blended into the general population budget. If we look at floor space, uh, we all recognize that floor space can, is a drive, can be a driver of final body weight. But interestingly in Shull, in their data, they had a variety of, of body, of, of feeder or of floor space. But we can see that from week six to week 16 in this particular study, it had no impact on the CV of the body weight of pigs at different floor space amounts. Now we do recognize, as I just said, that floor space is, can be a driver of pig growth. And in fact, they saw that in this data set. As they increased the floor space uh, meters per pig, again, at the beginning is when they allotted, so they were all the same body weight. We can see at day 10, there started to be a quadratic effect. And at week 16, you'll see that as more floor space was allowed, the heavier the pigs were. But this did not impact the CV of body weight of the pigs. We simply just changed the growth rate of the entire population. So thus what this shows is the smallest pigs and heaviest pigs were impacted the same by floor space. And that's not necessarily a driver of causing smaller pigs to be smaller or the bigger pigs to be bigger within a population. Is simply it was a function of the entire population shifting their body weight when CV did not change. Similar with, with uh, uh, feeder space, and it's interesting in this particular study, uh, as we look at high density or low density on feeder space, but interestingly on high density, it's about five and a half uh, pigs per feeder space, which is not extremely high feeder density, or in low where those pigs were offered, where 2.2 pigs had access to each feeder space. And in this particular case, again, they started the same at day 28. And as we look at the uh, uh, differences, we see when they were offered the low or had more feeder access, in fact, their CV was di statistically different at day 92 and numerically maintained that all the way out to the end, thus giving more feeder space and allowing them decrease their CV, even though, in the, again, in the high density, we, we, would, we would not consider extremely high at 5.5 pigs per feeder space. And this was simply a driver of growth. And from taking to the last data set, again, they started the same. And again, under a low density, they simply start to have higher statistical final body weights at those particular places, thus shifting the population uh, to a higher body weight with a lower CV. As we look at added fat, added fat's a common practice for many producers. And in this particular case, Hasted, there's a couple studies and there's a lot of information. I just have it boiled down to one slide. And ultimately what I wanna show is that this small dotted line is the mixed population if we have no fat addition, okay? And then this, this uh, wide dotted line, okay? is mixed with fat addition, or as we shift to the right, we're making the pigs heavier, thus showing that yes, in fact, heavier pigs uh, were a result of, of, of being fed fat. But if we take and combine the heaviest pigs with no fat and the lightest pigs with fat, we can see we can shift that line over and thus basically have an impact of, of having lighter pigs fed fat more precisely, increasing their body weight, and thus, if we have more time to show the data, we can actually influence the CV of that population by more strategically feeding those light pigs more energy to get them to a higher body weight. The last area I want to talk about is health. Uh, health, we understand, is going to have an impact, but there's very little data on, uh, that's been collected on health status looking at the CV of the pig population. And in this particular case, I want to highlight, um, they had a commercial system where these, all these pigs were exposed to PERS and the high health challenge were also exposed to influenza. And if we look at the CV body weight and these pigs were already in the barn, okay? And so they were already in the barn, went through these challenges and in 
started to see the differences in CV when under the low of just a PERS or PERS and influenza, a higher level of PEG variation is reflected by CV at the start, as well as that was maintained at the end. So those pigs were challenged early and that difference was maintained all the way to the end. And we can see this in average daily gain. Again, this is the same data set where the, again, there's a moderate in here as well. And again, where all pigs were exposed to PERS and different levels then of uh, influenza at the, at the moderate and high. And again, reflective of healthier pigs that weren't exposed to as much disease pressure had higher average daily gain. And also this was reflective in the CV that I just reported on the previous slide. So as we look at take home messages, research has shown that pig weight variation within a population can be influenced by management nutrition. The single best approach to reduce these is not clear. And again, I think that needs to be highlighted. We can have impacts, but to say that the one is the clearest way to get there is certainly not available currently in the data. Several strategies reviewed showed inconsistent responses. Well, and again, I showed some positive responses. I've also showed no differences and within these, there's many data sets, again, that we could show that some of these just simply weren't consistent in the measurements taking. So we need further evaluation of some of these types of practices. The reality is the most practical strategies may need to be combined to have the single desired outcomes. Many that I talked about or listed today, we probably need to implore more than one to have to reach each a desired outcome. Certainly increased weaning age has probably shown one of the most consistent ways to increase to improve uh, body, uh, the CV of a pig population. And in general, I think we need to focus on the lighter or slowest pigs. Um, and this isn't anything new as we look at how do we improve or how do we make sure we don't put those pigs back to that not only are they slower growing, but then we increase the CV of that pig population. There's many ways that we've not only talked about, uh, but ways that we need to look at future research to know how we can handle those lightest pigs either on while they're still suckling or in the nursery, or we have to get better at designing our facilities that we can feed budget or may feed deliver those pigs different diets or more nutrient rich diets compared to the biggest pigs or the other pigs if we wanna have an impact on body weight CV. And again, we need to understand these relationships as they go through the different stages of life and where we can have an impact to ultimately lead to more profitability for our swine producers. With that, uh, that concludes my area of uh, looking at CV. Next, I wanna tee up uh, Dr. Bob Goodband. Dr. Goodband is gonna have the last session uh, here this morning. And what he wants to do is look at all the additional research done by our current graduate students, as well as highlight them and their background and what they're working on uh, to promote them as they're certainly the lifeblood of our program, uh, helping us with the research and information um, that's being done. With that, I'll turn things over to Bob.